people say, well, a large percent of the population has H. pylori, and that, that is true. And so the question is, are you immunocompromised whether that H. pylori is an issue or not? There are a lot of people that can survive on four or five hours a night sleep. But once you become stressed and your adrenals become dysfunctional and your diet's been poor for a while, that four or five hours of sleep may not be enough. So you have to look at the, the context of the person for sure. Yeah. So hard. How's my audio coming in? Is my audio coming in good? It, it sounds decent. It could just be the bit rate or something. I, I do believe you have it on your USB now. It just sounds like it's a little grainy, but it, on, I know on our local end, it'll be just fine. So it's, it's plenty good enough for today. Okay. Excellent. All right. So out of the gates here, just kind of hitting all the right things that we're chatting about. Um, so we talked about the susceptibility for H. pylori, right? H. pylori is going to be one of these things that may be a problem in people that have symptoms. So if you have symptoms, if you have issues, we, we want to look at that out of the gates for sure. I think that's going to be a top priority. Um, anything else you want to highlight regarding other infections? I know SIBO is another one that could potentially affect digestibility in your stomach. Um, SIBO is going to hit more of your small intestine, but some of that bacteria overgrowth can move its way and migrate to the stomach as well, to the gastric area. Yeah. Well, I think H. pylori is probably the biggest smoking gum, but like you and I talk about many times, you can have permission to have multiple things wrong with you, right? You said that. So it's funny because we'll see candida, we'll see bacteria, we'll see H. pylori, which is a bacteria, we'll see parasites, we'll see worms. So the cool thing is when we come in with the testing, we're often using full spectrum herbs. And what I mean by that is we're going to try to knock out candida, bacterial overgrowth, the H. pylori, the parasites. Often we can do it in one fell swoop. And it's really fun to do this in children mm -hmm. or young adults because they, they tend to get better faster. Like if I see a, a five to 15 year old kid and we're working with them, it's amazing how much faster they get better than like a 70 year old adult, for example. It's something that I think shows the immune system being weak long term this can be a bigger problem. So when you hear about stomach cancer and the ulcers and esophageal problems and GERD and some of these more scary diagnoses, these are likely more long-term infections, or it could be the virulence factors, which are something that we test for. If you look into the research, H. pylori by itself is not going to cause a ton of problem in the short term, but when it has these virulence factors, that essentially strengthens the disease. The way I think about it is like the little whale shark or actually whale sharks are huge, but the whale shark with the little fish that kind of swim under its fins, to me, those are the virulence factors. They kind of strengthen the main host there. They're allowing the H. pylori to thrive. They're allowing that shark to do what he needs to do. They're helping to maybe eat parasites off of the shark. So they're kind of helping him hang around. And that's how I think of these virulence factors. It doesn't change the protocol much, but when we see a ton of inflammation or when we see a ton of gut damage, it's good to be able to link that back to a stool test. 100%. You know, the virulence factors are going to look at those cytotoxic proteins and it's a genetic susceptibility of this H. pylori is going to produce more toxins that are going to increase your chance of ulceration, increase your chance of stomach cancer, increase your chance of just overall general inflammation. So it's nice to look at the virulence factors. Now we have a couple of them. We have like VRD, VACA, VAGA, OIPA, ISA, these different virulence factors, these are cytotoxic proteins. And so it's good to look at that. Now, one of the things we'll also look at in regards to intestinal inflammation to kind of make correlations is we'll look at calprotectin. Calprotectin is another systemic marker that's excellent to look at because it plays a major role with inflammation in the gut as well. And so that's a really good one. So it's like a C-reactive protein for your gut. CRP is a, basically an inflammatory marker for the body. C-reactive protein, calprotectin is a protein produced by the white blood cells in the intestine. So when there's more inflammation, more cytokines, more interleukins, nuclear factor, kappa beta, all these inflammatory presence, um, it's going to give you more of a window that that's happening. Now, it doesn't tell you what the cause of it is that so you need to do detective work and get to the bottom. It's going to be usually one of four or five things, some type of infection, some type of food allergy, some type of immune stressor, whether it's exposure to mold or heavy metals. Okay. Uh, it can also be gut permeability where things are getting into the bloodstream and you're having this immunological reaction. Those are probably be the big four out of the gates. And then I think um, also just if you're eating a lot of junky inflammatory foods, omega-6 grains, a lot of pro-inflammatory foods, those could also drive it too.